Well, hello, everyone. My name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society that's based in the Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. area. And today, we're so fortunate to have Nature's Nursery Center for Wildlife Rehabilitation and Conservation Education programming here today, as we've been so fortunate to do this month of November. So today, Jamie Forbush, who is the Education Director of the Center, is going to be talking about what do reptiles and amphibians give. Uh, so as Jamie says, we're going to learn about nature's nursery slithery and slimy ambassadors. How did they find themselves at the center? And why could they not go back out into the wild? So she's going to talk a lot about the role of these scaly critters in our environment. But before we go on, I want to give a warm welcome to Jamie. And I understand Jamie has some very exciting news for all of us today. Hello, Jamie. Hi. Yes, so I'm Jamie Forbush, the Education Director here at Nature's Nursery. And I have some very, very exciting news that has been many, many years um, coming. So we just got um, approved for, or we just signed a lease for some land, which we desperately needed. Um, because as you saw in the first um, video, just kind of how small we are and how much, well, I guess how little room we actually have here at the center. Um, so we are in um, a 1,500 foot square building. Um, we do have about um, three quarters of an acre outside that we utilize for outside animal caging. And with this new property, we now have the ability to build a 6,000 square foot building, which is desperately needed, um, and hopefully room to expand from there. We also have, um, we're so at that place, we're sitting on three and a half acres. Um, so we have room for so much outdoor um, space for uh, rehabilitation and for education as well. So we are going to be partly open to the public. That's the plan at least. Um, so some days, you know, we'll be open. Other days we'll be closed to get things done. But um, we'll have a nice outdoor area where people can walk around and look at, at some of our ambassadors that right now nobody can really see except virtually because they're in with or they're near other um, rehab animals and we can't allow the public, um, due to permitting reasons, can't allow the public to see those rehab animals because they are healing and we want to get them to stay wild. So the least amount of visuals with humans is best. Um, so right now our uh, playful Lenny, uh, the fox, is outside in the area where people can't see them. We have um, our large raptors out back where people can't see them unless I bring them over here for programs. Um, we have a black vulture that does not like going on programs, um, so he just kind of stays in his cage. And um, there's a couple of volunteers he likes, um, and a couple of staff members he likes. I am not one of those staff members he likes, so I. Don't. <laughs> um, but um, and then we have like a coyote that nobody can really see right now because she's off. Um, you know, she, she likes to hide, and at this other facility, she'll be able to. You'll be able to see her a little bit better with the caging design that we have planned. So a lot of animals. Oh, we also have a double-crested cormorant, which is really cool. Most people don't have those in captivity. It was just circumstantial how we ended up with her. Um, but she's been around for over 10 years. But people really don't get to see her much because she's in that rehab section, um, or at least not in the rehab section, but she's around those rehab animals in cages. So she's not in cages with them. She's separate from them. Um, but she's around them, and so we have to make sure to limit human contact with other the animals. So it's oh, yeah. so, yeah. so exciting, and just the yeah. amount of space and things we can do is fantastic. <laughs> that's so exciting. Thank you for sharing with us. And I'm just going to going to interject here to mm -hmm. everyone that Nature's Nursery is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and it's located in White House, Ohio. I'm just going to read you a short description. So the center provides medical care to injured, orphaned, or ailing wild animals and conducts conservation educational outreach programs for children and adults. And the mission of the center is to improve the well-being of Northwest Ohio wildlife populations 
and habitats through public education and rehabilitation with an emphasis on coexistence. What a mighty mission. That's just so amazing. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to say, Jamie, you take it away with your program. And when we finish, I am going to have a slide up that will show everyone where they can go to give a donation and to learn much more about the great work that you're doing. Thank you. All right. The program's all yours. Awesome. So today I have some reptilian friends and some amphibious ones. Um, our amphibious ones, actually, um, this is his first time out on a program. So we got a couple of new ambassadors this year. So this is kind of his debut. His uh, sister got a debut a couple of weeks ago, so now it's his turn. Um, and I'm going to bring him out now really quick. So I'm going to pull it out of his cage and hold him for a second, um, but then I'm going to stick him back in because uh, he doesn't he hasn't been handled very much yet because he's so new. And he just got his name last week, and his sister did too. So his sister's name is Harriet, and his name is James. So he's our little toad friend. There we go. Don't know how well you can see him, but he's going to do fantastic teaching kids about his species and other or amphibious species as well. So James has only been with us for a couple months now. And he actually was taken out of the wild five years ago with his sister. Um, he had two sisters, but unfortunately one we noticed wasn't doing too well. And we're wondering if maybe that's why um, the person who took them from the wild didn't want them anymore. So we're estimating them at five years old, but toads can, in captivity can live to be about 10, um, some even longer than that. Um, the oldest one lived to be 36. So we're really rooting for these guys to live a while. Um, the person who had them was just going to release them back out into the wild, uh, but these guys were hand-fed, and they're not the best at catching animals. Um, they're getting better at it, because uh, we just throw crickets in their cage, but um, he was... He's hiding. Um, he was actually hand-fed by the previous owner. And these guys are so cool. Uh, I love toads of all kinds. Uh, in our area, we have two different types of toads. We have the American toad and we have the Fowler's toad. Really, they look so similar. You can barely tell the difference between them. There's just a couple of... So toads have spots. And in those spots, they have warts. And if you count the warts, you can figure out which species it is. Um, but just like with all animals, everybody's different. Everybody looks different. Um, and sometimes you can have a toad that has more spots or more warts in a spot than another one. So sometimes it can be difficult um, to tell the difference between their species unless you hear them call. So they do have very two distinct calls. Um, the American toad can... I, can, I think they're kind of annoying because <laughs> it's loud, and when you're inside, I like to I do frog monitoring in my personal time. And uh, in the spring, the American toads, oh my goodness, when you have a whole pond filled with them and they're all singing at once, um, it's very loud and noisy, and it doesn't stop. It's just constant noise the whole time, <laughs> which is cool and amazing. Um, it's just, oh. With your headache, it's definitely, you don't want a headache when you're doing frog monitoring. It's not fun. Um, but oh, they're just so cool. So amphibians are one of the indicator species of how well our water quality is. If you have a, a stream that's been heavily polluted, these animals cannot survive. Toads can survive a little bit better because they can go on land. But some of our more amphibious friends, like uh, leopard frogs, they live in the water, and so and they breathe through the water. And so if the water is polluted, those species aren't going to be there. And so to have, I mean, Toledo, which is um, where White House is close to, uh, Toledo is known as the frog town. Uh, people would come here and just hear a cacophony of all these different frog sounds. And unfortunately, because of drainage and farming and people building houses and roads, that's, the habitat's really gone away. And so uh, that to have these species still here and still singing their song lets us know that at least some of the water is the least good and it's still providing for the animals because when the water quality starts going down, 
we might not notice it right away, but the frogs do, and there's not going to be frogs if we continue to, you know, pollute our waters. So that's why I think their species is so amazing, because to have these animals here is really incredible. Just how delicate, I guess, they are to environmental changes. And I have actually a lot of friends with me today because I love reptiles, so I brought our entire reptile room into this room. Um, so I'll bring out my next one. And we do have actually a few non-native species here with us. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, I won't get into those reasons. There's lots of reasons. Um, but this one, we actually just got her donated to us. I got to find her because she's still a baby. So this isn't her debut, but she's only been with us for a couple of months. Oh, she really dug down into her substrate. Hey, Missy. <laughs> so this is one of our new friends. Her name, I'll get her up close here. Of course, she's going to go the opposite direction I want her to. There we go. You can see her little cute little face. So this is Suzanne, and she is a baby corn snake. Uh, we've had her technically for a year, um, but she actually lived with a volunteer because she was so tiny, we were afraid to have her here at the center. Um, so she lived with her namesake. Um, so uh, she came to us because a volunteer's friend actually raises and breeds corn snakes um, for fun, just to see what colors he can get. And um, he donated her to us. Um, because our previous corn snake, who, oh, he was an amazing snake. Um, but unfortunately, he passed away um, last year. And so uh, he donated uh, Suzanne to kind of fill in that um, spot we were missing here. And so Suzanne is learning. She's only a year old. She's kind of a runt. Um, of course, out of all our animals, we get the one that's tough to feed. Um, Suzanne was very picky. And we learned after a year that we could only get her to eat if we soaked her pinky mice, because she only eats pinkies right now, the little tiny baby mice. She only eats them if we soak them in tuna water first. <laughs> um, and so it took us a while to figure out why she wasn't eating, but apparently she's very particular. Um, but she's doing pretty well right now, So, and she's about half the size she should be because of her... Um, choosing not to eat because she had to have very special diets, which is lucky because we like spoiling our animals here. So she gets her tuna soaked mice uh, once a week. She's a beautiful color. Oh, yeah. So she's not like a typical corn snake um, because from the gentleman that we got her from, he does like to kind of look at the different um, colors, especially with um, – snakes that were bred in captivity, they do have a different coloration than their wild counterpart. Um, our, their wild corn, counterpart, corn snakes, are found in southern United States, and they actually have a kind of maize corn pattern on their bellies, and that's where they get their name. And they're great for the environment because they eat things people don't like. They like to eat the mice. Oh, my goodness. They eat so much. I mean, well, they don't eat so much. They eat about a mouse a week. Um, so snakes, we really don't have any venomous snakes in Northwest Ohio. We have one, um, but people were so afraid of them that they actually um, removed them off from this area is a nice way to put it. Um, and so they've been extirpated, and they can only be found in a certain park in Michigan. It's the Eastern Massasago Rattlesnake. Um, so most of our snakes in Northwest Ohio um, are not venomous at all, and they're really good to have because snakes just don't eat mice. They eat other things, too. They eat insects, um, which we know there's a lot of insects in the wild, so it's good that we have a lot of critters eating those guys. Oh, they're just so fantastic. And, yes, she might, since she is a baby, she's a little bit more bitey than the other ones, but people always ask me what it feels like to get bit by a snake. I've never been bit. They try to scare me before they bite. They know they can't eat me. They're too small. And so what they do is they try to scare you away. So they'll pretend they're going to strike you, and they'll um, kind of shoot their head out and tag you is what it's called with their face, but they don't bite. And as long as you leave them alone, they're going to go away. They're not going to do anything to you if you don't touch them. 
You just leave them be and let them do their business. They'll eat all the mice in your yard and your garden. So you have fruit to eat next year or in the fall when you harvest. So those mice don't get into it. Because wherever there's people, there's mice. Guaranteed. It's going to happen. So I'm going to put her back. She did such a good job. I'm very proud of her. So she's only gone on a couple of programs this year. And actually, the one program I took her on was kind of, it was outside in a very, very cold temperatures. Um, so I had to make this whole heating pad um, enclosure with a cooler and all sorts of things so these kids can see her. It was a big event, but she did fantastic and her temperatures stayed great. Um, but I couldn't have her out for very long because it was cold. So she's still staff only, so we don't have our volunteers holding her. But did you see how tiny she is? So small. And our next scaly friend is a native animal. It's another snake. But this one can technically be found around here um, as a black rat snake. But this particular species, she's not a black rat snake. She's a subspecies, so she's a gray rat snake. And it's interesting. She even has a black tongue. Most snakes have pink tongues, so it's very cool. And you'll be shocked. So remember how small Suzanne was? Hi, Sage. Sage is an old pro with education. So she's been with us for over 13 years. And she's much, much, much bigger. Oh, much bigger. Yeah, I don't even call her yet. She's still coming out of the blanket. Where's your tail? There we go. <laughs> so where Suzanne is about the length of a pencil, Sage here is taller or longer than I am tall. So she's over six feet long. Doesn't seem like that when she's balled up in my arms. Um, but she actually was another snake that was in captivity. Uh, she hatched at a Dollar Nature Center. And she actually toured all of the state parks for about a year before she came to live with us. And she lived at the state parks during the summer. And they didn't have a place to keep her during winter because these snakes, they do need heat. And so we kept her during winter. And we used her for winter programming. And then we just switched. And then eventually we were just like, you know what? Just keep her year-round. And so she was fantastic, and she did excellent last year when our other snake, Zippy, passed away because she had double duty. So not only was she doing her normal program, she had to take over Zippy's as well. And so where she was doing about 50 programs a year, it jumped to about 100. Oh. So she's done a fantastic job. Um, oh, they're so cool. And she is so particular. Um, we always talk about enrichment with our dogs and cats, right? Um, giving them something fun to do because they're inside all day. Um, well, snakes love enrichment too, especially sage. So um, I have some videos on our Facebook page that I post or that I sent to um, our social media person who posted them, and it's of sage actually exploring the different types of enrichment we gave her. Um, she's very she loves exploring. If you can't tell, she's all over the place right now, just smelling all the new smells. And um, inside of her cage, we give her different textured mats. So instead of like a substrate, we'll give her um, or maybe a rope, like a rope mat or um, astroturf or like a daisy mat. And she loves, loves, loves just exploring it so much where she actually slept on it one night. That's how much I loved it. Um, and so it's really cool. Like their snakes are so smart. And they're just like, you know, your dogs and cats. They're just you know, cold-blooded, and they don't like pets as much, um, or getting, getting petted. But Sage, she's obviously significantly larger than Suzanne will ever be. Um, Suzanne will probably grow up to be three, four feet long. Sage is six, and she's still growing. Um, and they don't eat just rodents, I mean, just mice. They eat rats, too. I mean, gray rat snake is in their name. Uh, and they are big enough to eat smaller rats. Not those really big ones that are, like, running around, but the <laughs> smaller ones. Um, she also, um, she does eat birds sometimes. Not her specifically, but her species. Um, they have been known to climb up bird, into birdhouses 
and consuming birds, and they eat eggs sometimes, sometimes, very rare. Um, and they do eat insects occasionally. But for the most part, they do eat rodents. Rodents are a lot easier for them to catch, um, unless it's like a baby bird stuck in the nest. I know that sounds horrible, but it does happen, especially if she eats those nasty house sparrows, right? <laughs> so they're great, great animals to have in the environment. And if you leave them alone, they leave you alone. And that's the biggest thing. You don't have to touch them. You can appreciate them from a distance, is what I like saying to people who are not comfortable around snakes. Appreciate them from a distance and know that they're eating all the pests that you might not want in your yard. Hi. Let's not go into my hair. You're going to get stuck. She has a lot of flooring. Oh, my goodness. During the summertime, when it's nice and warm out, we'll take her outside. Um, we have this pen that we put her in. But we have to obviously watch her because she can climb out of it. But um, at least she can explore the grass because, oh, my goodness, does she love exploring. She loves the smells. They're just so, they're so good for the environment, and they're horribly misunderstood. I think all snakes really are. People see a snake and get terrified, and, and think it's because they move quick. Mm -hmm. And in most places, there are venomous snakes. But again, you just leave them be, they leave you be. And they give you, usually they give you plenty of warning to get away before they bite. But like I always say in, to uh, most kids who are afraid of animals, I ask them, if, are they bigger than that animal? And usually they go, yeah. And I say, well, if, if you're bigger than them, they think you're going to eat them. <laughs> they don't want to eat you. It does take me a minute to get her back in her pillowcase. Well, you're a wonderful ambassador for snakes and for your, your friends there. Oh, yes. I love, oh, my goodness. They're so cool. So we're going to move away from our, our legless friends and go to animals that people generally love to have as pets, the turtles and tortoises. Okay. And while you're doing that, Jamie, I just want to remind everyone that Nature's Nursery has a new building fund. And if you would like to make a donation, please do. Just go to Nature's, N-A-T-U-R-E-S, dash nursery n u r s e r y dot org and you'll find all kinds of brand new information about this very exciting uh, facility plan that you can participate in by learning more about it and by donating and helping to support it. Thanks. All right. So here's our next ambassador friend. Again, she's a non-native animal. So this is Scarlet, and she is a western box turtle. And their range is typically, obviously, in western part of the United States, not eastern, which is where we are. So it was very strange to have her walking down the streets in the middle of winter. Um, so what we think happened is somebody has her as a pet because... You can have western box turtles as pets around here. And so we don't know which, so there's two types of western box turtles. There's the ornate box turtle and the desert box turtle. We don't know which one she is because they look very similar. Um, and one's a subspecies of the other one. So we just call her a western box turtle to make it simple. Well, we think she was somebody's pet. And since she was found in January, walking down the streets, uh, we definitely know she was somebody's pet or had some... And, you know, somebody took her out of the wild either or had her as a pet and then released her, um, which is common for a lot of animals. A lot of animals like turtles and reptiles that people think that, oh, I'm going to have it as a pet and then I can just put it back in the wild. It's fine. Well, it's not because she didn't hibernate. She was walking down the streets and it was very cold out. Um, so she found a home with us. She's been with us since 1997, so a very, very long time. And she's been a great ambassador. Uh, we actually teach, when I take her out on programs, um, we actually have an eastern box turtle. And so I can show the two side by side compared. Unfortunately, they, they're not friends anymore. There was a whole dramatic thing between our three turtles. And Scarlet has to be separated from the other two because we tried adding another box turtle that the other box turtle didn't like. It was a whole dramatic. Honestly, we could probably wrote it like a sitcom story about it, about the turtle relationships that we have here. 
Um, so Scarlett has a whole tank to herself, which honestly I don't think she cares. I think she loves the tank by herself. Um, but she does get exercise every day. Well, we try to. Um, it is cold out, so we let her walk around um, the reptile room and kind of explore. She gets herself in trouble. She always likes to crawl right next to the door, so we have to be very careful opening the door. But they eat tons of things that you wouldn't expect. And I'll get in more into it when I bring out our other ambassador because he's the native one. The ones that you can actually find if you're outside. And we know she's a female because she's rather small compared to the male box, male western box turtle counterparts. With Lefty here though, we, he's bigger than the eastern or the western box turtle. So eastern box turtles are significantly larger because female turtles tend to be larger than male turtles and she's the female version of the western box turtle. So we know that she, the male is even smaller and he's bigger than her. So this is Lefty. Hopefully you can see a couple of things. The first thing I'll show you is his arm. It's kind of why he's called Lefty. And his eyes. So you can see his red eye there. So Lefty came to us um, because a woman was driving down the road and she saw a turtle in it, picked him up and put him to the side of the road like you're supposed to do. And then she went on her way. Well, a couple of days later she was driving down the road again and guess who she saw in the middle of the road? Um, she knew it was the same turtle because the leg was already missing. So she picked him up and put him to the side of the road again and went on her way. And a couple of days later, he was found back in the middle of the road. And at this point, she was like, okay, it's the same turtle. He's missing his leg. He's been on the road three times. Who? And that's just her. Who knows who else found him and put him to the side of the road. So she's like, she called us up, asked if we can do anything, just look him over and see why does this turtle keep ending up on the road. So she brought him in, and we noticed a couple of things. We noticed that, one, his eyes are red. That means he's a male in, box, in eastern box turtles. If their eyes are red, it means they're boys. Not all the time. There's always exceptions in the animal kingdom. There's always exceptions. Um, but So we knew he was a boy. Um, other characteristics as well, but I won't get into that. And then uh, his leg was missing, but it looked like an old injury um, or something maybe he was born with. But then we notice this. So there are two cracks on the bottom of the shell. The first one goes straight across his belly. That's called a hinge. It's supposed to be there. Scarlet has one as well. But then there's a crack that goes from the middle of his belly to up to his, um, the, basically his neck. Um, so that's his plastron, and his plastron was cracked. And I'll see, I don't know how well it'll come over camera, but I'll point to it with this finger. There is a crack right here that kind of goes up. You can see where it ends. We can we can see it. You can? Cool. Yes. So that's the crack that um, that woman found. He likes walking. He's definitely one who loves to explore. Um, so uh, we think what may have happened is because he's overly friendly. He should be hiding in the shell right now, and he's not. Um, and he wasn't, he was the same way when we got him. So, what our theory is, is that somebody had him as a pet, released him into the wild, he got attacked by a predator, which caused him to lose his leg and get that crack on his shell. Um, the turtle's skin heals quickly. Their shell takes forever to heal, almost a year. So, we had Lefty for a year um, while he healed. And we got him around 2,000, so he's about 20 years old, and you can still see that crack on the bottom of his shell. It wasn't going to heal. Um, it's not going to heal completely. It's always going to be weak there, and that's true for any turtle. Once it, once they get that crack in their shell, um, it's, it's always going to be weaker in that spot. And so with Lefty, um, we would have released him still, except for the fact that he is way too friendly. They don't really need their front legs for digging. They need their back legs. Um, to do that to hibernate. Um, but since Lefty is just way too friendly, uh, we could not release him. Um, he would just get hurt again. And so he happily lives here with us. Um, he's actually buddies with the next one I'm going to bring out. They follow each other around all the time. Um, but he's also the instigator. He's the reason we can't have Scarlet in with the other tortoise um, because
is eat the jerk. No, you will, um, in the wild, they'll eat, uh, you know, common fruits and vegetables. They'll eat strawberries, blueberries, um, other berries that they can find in the wild. Um, they even eat, I don't know if you guys are familiar with plants, but if you look up the, it's called the May apple. It's a very common plant. Um, it has, uh, it looks almost like an umbrella, and it's the first uh, really nice native plant to grow in the spring, and it has a fruit on the bottom side of it. And that's what these guys eat. They eat the fruit. Um, for us, we, it'd make us sick if we ate too many of them. Um, but for them, it doesn't matter. Um, they even eat mushrooms, um, even the poisonous kind. So things that if we ate, it would make us sick, they eat it. So you don't want to eat a fox turtle um, because it's in their skin. Um, so they're actually a little uh, poisonous themselves. Um, and then they also eat something which I, it blew my mind when I learned this. They eat carrion, too. So sometimes, which makes sense because they are found in the road a lot, usually because they're traveling from one place to another and their habitat has been fragmented. And so in order for them to get somewhere, they do have to cross a lot of roads. Um, but for him uh, and other of, of their species, they'll actually go into roads to also eat dead things as well. So not only are they, they're kind of like opossums in a way. They're kind of like nature's garbage men, but in reptile form. Um, so that's a good way to describe them. So they eat all the things that you don't want to see on the ground. They also, um, a lot of people ask, do turtles have ears? And they do, but they're not like ours. So when I put Lefty up there, you can look at his head, and there's kind of an indentation a little bit that looks like a circle. Um, but it's covered. There's no hole. And that's where his ear is. Of course, he's going to put his head a little bit in the shell so you can't quite see it. <laughs> a little bit. So that's called a tympanic membrane. And basically, think of it like a drum. He hears, but he hears vibrations. He doesn't hear words like we do. All right, so I'm going to put him back. He also likes to climb out of his box. He's an excellent three legs does not slow him down. He's an excellent, excellent, excellent climber um, to the point where we actually have like a little pop-up dog pen. He can climb vertically straight up that and out. So we really have to watch him and on programs to make sure he's not climbing out of whatever thing we put him in. I didn't know this when I started working here, so I was very shocked to see a turtle climbing vertically up a wall. I was like, what is happening? My mind was blown. All right, so I'm going to bring out my next friend. She is a little bit bigger than the other guys. And I might even set her up on this. So let me move this critter out of the way. Only because she has a quirk. It's a funny quirk that I always like to prank my interns with when I get them during the summer. I don't tell them that even though she's a desert tortoise, you know, desert tortoise, you wouldn't think goes to the bathroom a lot. Well, she does. And so, and it's not, a, it's not like a little bit of urine. It's a lot of urine. It's like a bucket's worth. So usually I have a bath towel under her to collect all the urine. So my interns don't know this, and they're holding her like the other turtles. It's kind of mean, but it's funny. Hi, Dobie. Hi there. All right. She's a very big animal. And she's actually smaller than they typically would be at this size. Um, let me see. Let's down a little bit more. There we go. So this is a Dobie. She's a desert tortoise. And she has been with us for 30 years. So we've been around for 31 years. So we've had her practically since the beginning. And we have her for a very special reason. So desert tortoise obviously wouldn't be found around here. Um, we have her because somebody said that their pet turtle was getting too big for their tank. And they couldn't find a tank big enough for her. Well, we said, as a response, the turtles are your pets for life. You got them knowing how long they live. Because Lefty and Scarlet, they live about 100 years. So you have to think about even after you, who is going to take care of them. 
So when we got Adobe, uh, well, the woman said next after she said, well, it's not a pet turtle. It's a wild turtle we picked up in Arizona, and she was an orphan, and that's why we took care of her. Well, tortoise turtles and most reptiles, there are very few reptiles that have any parental care. She's not one of them. So she was not an orphan. The woman said she was about the size of a quarter when she found her. Um, we think a little bit bigger than the size of a quarter. I think they hatch at the size of a quarter. Um, but what's very interesting about this species is that they're also endangered. Um, so when the woman, well, at least when the woman took them out of the wild, she was. So the woman didn't know any better. She truly thought she was helping the tortoise. Um, which is why she didn't get in, in as much trouble. Also, it was 30 years ago. If this happened today, well, very big no-no. Um, but this happened, like I said, 30 years ago. So uh, she is, I guess I'll start with the laws. You're not allowed to take an animal from the wild. That's against the law. Any wild animal. You're not allowed to take animals across state lines. So from Arizona to Ohio, it's quite a few laws there. Um, and she was also an endangered species, so she was federally endangered um, at the time. And I can say with 100% confidence that they were 100% endangered because of human cause, um, or human causes. And it was because people kept taking them out of the wild for the pet trade. Now, I don't know how well you can see it, but she has bumps on her shell. I don't want to hold her up to the camera because all my stuff is on the table right now, and I don't want her peeing on it. Um, but uh, these bumps are not natural. They're not supposed to be there. And that was because the woman who had her did not feed her properly. Uh, these tortoise and all turtles need a very specific diet. If you don't feed them the right thing, um, uh, there can be some harm. So she has a bone deformity that can never be fixed. If she rolls onto her back, she can't get over. Um, and it, it does happen because just like Lefty, she loves to climb. Well, she's built for it. Where Lefty, his arms were like paddles. They were straight. Um, he's made for swimming, kind of. I mean, he's still a terrestrial box turtle. Um, but Adobe, she's strictly made for on land. She cannot swim. And so uh, she is very good at climbing and loves to do it. So if she fell off of something like a rock, she wouldn't be able to flip over. And this, this is called pyramiding. It's caused by two things a lack of UVB light, um, which is true for most reptiles, which is what the light they get from the sun. It's also caused by um, basically a nutrient deficiency or overabundance. And she's strictly an herbivore. And she was lacking in calcium. The one didn't give her enough calcium, which she gets from grasses. And then she was also given protein. She's an herbivore. And so Adobe thinks she's supposed to be eating worms. Um, that's basically what the woman raised her on, and that's what she thinks she's supposed to be eating. She's not supposed to be eating that stuff. Um, so uh, with a protein overabundance, a nutrient, def um, a calcium deficiency, and lack of UVB light that caused this. And while we did get her pretty young, the damage was irreparable. We could not fix it. Um, so she is slightly smaller than she should be. Um, her shell is very bumpy. Um, we think she's a female. She could very well be a male. Um, we have no idea. Uh, but I think she's a female based off of some characteristics of her behavior. She's very territorial, which is interesting, um, which is common more of males. Like she does head bobs a lot, which is an indicative of male aggression in turtles. But she does. So she could be a male. But I'm pretty sure she's female. We have no reason to test her. She's not sick. Um, so there's no reason to get x-rays to figure out if she is a boy or a girl. We're not going to put her through that. And then, yeah, so these guys are super important to the, I know they're not native to here, but they're important to the wildlife of the desert because these guys dig holes over eight feet down into the ground in the desert where animals need to escape from the heat. And so her job, basically what she does, other animals benefit from their holes or from their dens. And they are great at digging. Not, Adobe, not so much. She likes digging in mulch for some reason. She doesn't dig in sand like she's supposed to. Um, but uh, she, in the wild, would 
dig huge holes. And sometimes the holes are so big that when um, they come together during winter for hibern so they hibernate together, um, there can be up to 60 turtles in one burrow of a desert tortoise, which is crazy to think that. And so the other wildlife, the rabbits, the uh, other rodents, um, anything that needs to escape from the sun rely on these turtles and or tortoise. Um, and so the fact that they were going endangered was very, very sad and could have been detrimental not only to um, the species, but to other species as well. So these guys are incredibly important to the wildlife. Luckily, now they're no longer endangered. Um, they're threatened, which isn't much better. Um, but they're no longer being sold in the pet trade. If somebody has them, um, you have to have an endangered species permit um, and actually like three other permits in order to have her, which we have. And um, unfortunately, though, all those turtles that were taken cannot be put back into the wild. Um, one, because they might not know how to be wild. And two, um, they could have, maybe from being in captivity, especially since a lot of them work out together, just like any animals, when there's a lot together, end up sicknesses end up passing from one to the other. And the last thing that anybody wants to do is put a sick turtle in the wild and then make them all sick. Um, and then what potentially wipe out the rest of the species. So unfortunately, there's thousands and thousands of tortoises that are looking for homes. Um, and it's not cheap to have one. Um, so there's a lot of sanctuaries for these guys. But yeah, they're, oh, they're just so cool. So they eat grass. 80% of their diet is grasses. Um, so she didn't really get 80. She gets, she kind of gets that now, but she's very stubborn and tortoises can go a long time without eating. And so if she doesn't get the things that she wants. Sometimes she just protests eating. Um, and right now she does live with the eastern box turtle because that's, um, well, one, we don't have very much space here. So at the new facility we will. And we just came up with a design where they can each have their own space in the smaller area because they do get exercise daily so they can move around a bit. Um, so we're working on it, but we finally have a plan where we can actually have all three turtles with the proper substrates and everything now, which is very exciting. And then even more space at a new facility. That's so exciting. It's really wonderful and so well deserved, that's for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how do you feed her then? You mentioned she eats grass. Um, yeah. Where do you get that grass from? Uh, how does that work? I remember on, uh, one of, uh, uh, either last week or the week before a session, uh, you were talking about how the local, um, grocer is usually cleaned out of greens because of the center's need to feed residents and patients. Tell us about, about how her feed is managed and what is that? Where do you get it? So we are lucky. We have, a, um, we work with a couple local, um, people who donate their expired produce that they can't have on the shelves anymore, but it's still good. Um, so that's sent to us. And while she doesn't get much of that produce, um, it's actually what she gets is Timothy hay. So um, she doesn't like Timothy hay, so we make basically what's called a turtle salad. Um, and we end up blending it with other foods, so she has no choice but to eat her grass. Um, she's very, very stubborn. And Lefty gets turtle salad too, but it's not going to hurt him. Um, so he gets a higher amount of grass than normal that he would be eating. Um, but it's not just regular grass. So the grass that you see on your lawns is actually Kentucky bluegrass, and it's not a native plant. Um, most native plants don't stay green all winter long. They're going to change brown. Um, so all that Kentucky bluegrass that everybody uses on their front yards is not native, and most turtles won't eat it. Um, but uh, with her, luckily, we can just use Timothy hay, which is what we feed our bunny anyways, and just basically blend it up in a salad for her to eat. Um, so it costs next to nothing to feed her. It's more um, just getting her temperatures right. That's hard, um, especially because she's a desert tortoise and Lefty's an eastern box turtle. So we have to take her especially out of the tank to give her a certain amount of light and heat every day. Um, so she's more labor intensive in that way, but hopefully once we get a new facility, we'll, she'll have enough space to do her digging and 
get her temperatures right. That's the hardest part is getting her temperatures right. Um, especially because we have like a room that, while it feels great during winter time, during summer, it's hotter than it is outside in that room. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you want to melt. Um, but it's pretty much for her to keep her content. She's getting active now. She wants to move. She'll get her exercise. So her exercise time is normally from noon to one. So she'll get her exercise time after. <laughs> but yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. So these are all my repti reptilian friends. Mine is one. We had another American toad who um, she didn't get. She her debut was a long time ago or a couple weeks ago. So it was it was James's turn. Um, but yeah, oh, she's looking. She's very curious. She's looking to see. Um, she can see uh, Suzanne in her tank. So she's checking out Suzanne. Um, they're really curious. Most people don't think reptiles have a personality, but they do. Like I said, turtles, oh, so much drama. Oh, <laughs> and turtles and tortoises. So a lot of people call turtles. Um, when somebody calls a tortoise a turtle, people kind of say, that's not a turtle, that's a tortoise. Um, tur tortoises are turtles. So they're just, um, it's kind of like how a square can be, or is it, a rectangle can be a square, but a square can't be a rectangle. Um, a tortoise is a turtle, but not all turtles can be a tortoise. So she is a turtle. She's also a tortoise at the same time. Well, this is really wonderful, Jamie. <laughs> well, thank you so much. For this is great. Thank you for giving us a tour and introducing us to your friends today. Um, I know that next week um, yeah. we are going to, um, Jamie's going to lead a program called What Do Birds Give? So as, she, as Jamie says, birds are incredibly important to the ecosystem. And uh, we're going to learn about nature's nurseries, feathered friends, and all of the ecosystems that they provide. So it's very, very interesting, very, very good. And before we leave, I would like to um, share my screen just for a moment, uh, if I'm able to here, and uh, go to the next slide where I would like to show everyone uh, where you can go to donate. Uh, so, again, it's Nature's Nursery Center for Wildlife Rehabilitation and Conservation Education in White House, Ohio. And you can make a donation in any amount uh, at the uh, donate page, and the proceeds will be deposited directly to the Nature's Nursery Bank account. And that link, again, is www.natures-nursery.org. N-A-T-U-R-E-S dash N-U-R-S-E-R-Y dot org. And if you'd like to send a check, those are absolutely welcome. And you can send them to Nature's Nursery, Post Office Box 2395, Box 2395 in White House, Ohio. And their zip there is 43571. Uh, 43571. And we do hope that you'll go to the Western Cuyahoga Audubon's what, uh, website and uh, read the article, Make a Donation to Nature's Nursery Wildlife Rehabilitation and White Center in White House, Ohio. And the link is there on the screen. Um, and last but not least, uh, we want you, and I'm going to flick the, uh, the slides back to the opening slide of this wonderful series of November live programs. Everyone has something to give. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see where you can go to Nature's Nursery or the wcaudubon.org website to learn more. Um, well, thank you again, Jamie, and congratulations on the wonderful um, new building fund. A very exciting. Uh, and uh, do go, you can see and learn more about that by going again to the naturesnursery.org website. And they have a beautiful new landing page with the information and beautiful pictures 
uh, about what the plan is all about. So thank you so much, Jamie. Um, you're an incredible ambassador, and we're learning a lot, a lot in appreciation and a lot of science uh, about the different animals that you um, rehabilitate and also home. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next Friday at noon for What Do Birds Give? Thank you. Thank you.